Okay. All right. Okay. So um, this is what most of you guys actually think when you think about adult congenital heart disease, right? I know. Because everybody avoids my cases in the cath lab. So everybody goes running, and all of a sudden, all the fellows are running in the hallway towards room one. And they think heart failure is probably easier to do at that point in time. So I'm not going to be able to get everything out in one hour session, right? I mean, that's the reality. But what I'm going to try to do is try to hone in on a few things that we definitely need to talk about and are very important when you actually assess these patients in uh, multimodality imaging, irrespective of what the imaging uh, source is. So one of the reasons why we need to talk about this is because the reality is, as you guys know, as you guys see more and more of these patients, is that this is actually going to be a tidal wave. And we're just not there yet. So um, why is that the case? Well, 1953 was really when everything started, when you could actually do cardiopulmonary bypass. Before that, there was the blaylock Cossack shunt in 1940s. But really, um, once that started, it started opening up effect effectively the proverbial can of worms, which basically meant that every time somebody did a new innovative method of saving one of, these, um, one of these congenital lesions, that basically meant that you opened up a whole new population that we're now seeing today. So starting in the 1950s, when you could actually do cardiopulmonary bypass and you could actually do open heart surgery in some of these babies, you could actually finally get them to, through their childhood for the very first time in history. So uh, tetrarchy flow, transposition of the great arteries, and then finally in the 1980s, we, uh, we were able to break through the single ventricle barrier and I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. And finally, what that means then is for the very first time, we have these 20-year-olds who are single ventricles for the first time in history. We have um, tetralogy flow patients who are as old as the 70s at this point in time because they were treated with the blaylock classic shunt in the 1940s. So what does it actually look like when we break down the numbers? Well, so in light gray, these are the admissions to hospital with pediatric congenital heart disease. And in dark gray, these are admissions to hospital with adults with congenital heart disease. And as you can see, in 2010, these numbers are catching up pretty quickly. We actually now think there are more adults with congenital heart disease than there are kids with congenital heart disease. And that number in the United States turns out to be about 1.4 million adults with congenital heart disease. That number is actually going to increase to about 2.2 million by 2020. So we're talking about a disease that every single one of us is going to have to deal with. And so just like with electrophysiology, which 15 years ago nobody knew anything about, once Scott Heff came around, everybody realized that they had to know the basic indications for an uh, implantable defibrillator. They had to know the basic indications for atrial fibrillation treatment, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the same thing that's going to happen with congenital heart disease. And when you think about it, it's going to be everybody's problem. Because if you have a normal life expectancy, living about 70, possibly even 80 years of life, that means we have a huge burden on our healthcare system. And this is not something that we can just push off to the pediatricians anymore. Because the reality is that in Houston alone, there's at least 30,000, if probably not more, just because of all the cardiac surgeries that were done here starting from the 1950s and 1960s. So what we're going to try to talk about today is to, um, I developed this framework for, um, for cardiology for the non-cardiologist, and I actually really like it. So we're going to try to use that to start with. Um, and then we're going to actually talk about some bit, very important expected issues that come up with congenital heart patients with specific types of lesions that I think are probably the most common ones that you're going to run into. And then we're going to actually talk about some basics about the optimal imaging techniques. Now, I, um, that's a lot to cover in an hour, so I'll probably only be able to touch on a few of those issues. So here's the framework. So we're going to talk about basic physiology, but then we're going to actually talk about left-right shunting and what the left-right shunting location actually does for each of these patients. We're going to talk about right-sided obstructions. We're going to talk about left-sided obstructions. Then we're going to talk about ventricular arterial discordance. And then finally, we're going to actually talk about single ventricle palliation and how to actually start to look at that, because that's going to be all of our problems going forward. So basic physiology. Just so we're on the same page, I'm sure everybody knows this, but this is the basic Mullins diagram. And I'm going to boil it down to a basically a box diagram, because I think it's a little bit simpler to understand. So obviously, you get your venous blood flow to the SVC, IVC, to the right atrium, right ventricle, which in normal patients gives rise to the pulmonary artery, which then gives rise to the pulmonary circulation, gets oxygenated, and returns the pulmonary venous circulation back to the left part, left atrium, left ventricle, goes to the aorta. And the aorta gives the systemic circulation in which you deposit your oxygen and, uh, and think of carbon dioxide, and then the system goes on and on. So that's what we take for granted in adult or postnatal physiology. Okay, obviously things are very, very different in the adult congenital heart world, and certainly in the pediatric congenital heart world. And the reason why that is because the fetal physiology is a little bit different. So I can't talk about that today because of time constraints. So I'm going to try to just touch on where these things go. So. One of the major pains in my butt is this whole right to left shunt thing. And one of the major problems that I have is this idea that a positive bubble study by echo almost always equals PFO. And in fact, most people seem to think that it's a PFO. 
So I'm going to show you some things where it's really not a PFO. So first case, let's talk about what is a PFO. So a PFO is a normal part of development. Because in the fetal circulation, the way you actually get your partially saturated blood flow is from the umbilical venous system from your mom. And so when that umbilical vein comes through, what you're actually getting is you need to somehow get that venous blood flow from the right side to the left side. Okay, and the way you're going to do that is to get it through the pain of valley. And we think that the eustachian valve probably plays some role in trying to get that um, umbilical venous blood flow to the left side so that you can actually circulate that saturated blood flow to the left ventricle and then to the ascending aorta and, um, and coronary arteries and the head and neck vessels, right? Because the reason why you want to do that is you want to get your highly saturated blood flow to your coronary arteries and your head and neck vessels, whereas your desaturated blood flow that comes from your PVA can probably go to the lower extremities and your abdominal organs too much damage. So a PFO is present in all of us, okay? It's every single one of us at birth. The thought process is now, now only about 30% of us continue to have a persistently patent pyramid of valley. And um, I'll move through this pretty quickly since we've actually gone through this. And sorry. Okay, so first case. So this is a 23-year-old man um, who presented with right-sided weakness, severe headache, and speech changes. Turned out he has cerebral abscess and grew graminic rods and strep, uh, rods and strep mitis, so really multifloral. So initially, um, he underwent a TEE um, that was uh, negative for endocarditis, but positive for a bubble study. So they decided to treat him medically, right, send him out of the hospital, and then he gets a further workup in his cardiologist's office a couple weeks later, gets a bubble study by transthoracic, negative. What's going on? PFO? Somebody shaking their head back. They're not volunteering the answers. Sinus venosis. What does that mean? You're just throwing out a diagnosis. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is not a fellows fellows conference, so I can't I can't act like the fellows cat conference. So si sinus venosis. Okay. All right. Other thoughts? That's your muted response. All right. What's going on here? What's this? Left-sided SVC. Two. Correct. An unroofed coronary sinus. Right. So that's why he's getting <coughs> right to left shunting, right? So that's why on his TEE, when they did a bubble study through his left arm, he had a positive bubble study. When they did the bubble study from his right arm, it was a negative bubble study. So this is a persistent left-sided SVC to an unroofed coronary sinus, and that's his obligatory source of right to left shunting. So first case where it's not a PFO. Okay, so it turns out he actually did have persistent left side SV2 and unroofed coronary sinus. We closed it with an amplastic vascular plug. Um, so it's important to know which arm you're injecting through because when you go back to do this again and you find that the bubble study is negative, that actually may be diagnostic for you when you go through this. And sometimes it's not that easy to find the unroofed coronary sinus. Sometimes we miss those. So that's why it's important to actually document which arm it's being injected. So here's another case that I get called on pretty commonly from the liver service. This is a 50-year-old guy, end-stage hep C cirrhosis. Um, he actually just had had a liver transplant, and now he's got orthodeoxyglycemia, or at least that's what they say that he has. He drops his saturation to 70%. So they say, hey, look, there's a PFO because he's got a positive bubble study. Can you close that? What do you guys think about this transesophageal echo? <coughs> Could be an AV malformation, right. But what do you think about the, the Freeman of Allen? It doesn't look widely patent by visual inspection. But if you're not if you're not if you're not doing Valsalva, can you be sure? Could be, could not be, right? Yeah, not sure. Right. Okay, so not enough here to, to figure it out. So this is in the cath lab. So you can see things are flipped around, so this is intracardiac echocardiography. So that's really funny, right? There's no bubbles in the right atrium, but you see a lot of bubbles coming in the left atrium. Huh. What's going on there? Any guesses? How would I get bubbles in the left atrium without getting in, in the right atrium? And I have not crossed the atrial septum. So Eric, you touched on this. So, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So when you have liver failure, right, you actually develop micropulmonary ABMs because you're lacking this quote-unquote hepatic factor that we don't fully understand. I'm, gonna go, I'm actually going to come back to that when we get to single ventricle physiology. So basically, this patient has developed micropulmonary ABMs throughout his bilateral lungs. And so what you're seeing here is I've actually put a catheter out into the left PA 
and done a bubble study um, with intracardiac echo. And that's why you've got bubbles coming into the left atrium. And actually, if you look carefully, you might actually see that they're coming in from the pulmonary vein. So you're getting pulmonary venous bubbles um, because we're injecting into the left PA, but they're not coming into the right atrium because obviously you have a confident pulmonic valve and a confident tricuspid valve, okay? So this is actually fairly common here in this institution because we're seeing a lot of these liver patients, right? So they're gonna have these positive bubble studies. They're not necessarily related to the PFO. So this is a PFO, right? So this is a 40-year-old woman with a recent cryptogenic stroke who was actually randomized in a reduced study. Um, and very clearly, now you can see a very obvious PFO, right? So this is a pretty standard PFO. So it's not to say that PFOs are not common, but I think yeah, I just wanted to challenge everybody to think a little bit more about other possibilities of positive bubble studies and right to left shunting that don't necessarily require the existence of the PFO. <coughs> so let's get into these shunts. So we generally categorize our shunts based upon the location, and that depends on whether or not it's, um, it's above or below the tricuspid valve. So we talk about pre-tricuspid shunts, and that's predominantly an atrial septal defect. Other things that are involved are things like total anomalous pulmonary venous return, which often also has an atrial septal defect, as well as partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. And of course, we also talked about the unroofed coronary sinus. On the other hand, post-tricuspid shunts like VSDs, PDAs, um, and aortopulmonary windows tend to cause left-sided heart failure. Now, I know that's very hard for us to think about in the adult world because we almost never see this. <coughs> but when you actually think about the child who has normal pulmonary vascular resistance, in a baby, what it does is it actually causes enlargement of both the left atrium and the left ventricle, and ultimately you can have some very bad left-sided heart failure. And I'll show you a little bit of a case of that in a second. So starting with the atrial septal defect. So as you all know, the secundum atrial septal defect is the most common uh, atrial septal defect. And the nice thing about it is it's about two-thirds of uh, two -thirds, uh, most common. Um, and in fact, it's one of the only uh, closable by transcatheter methods. And of course, after that is the premium atrial septal defect, which you'll hear Dr. McGill very say all the time. It's actually not an atrial septal defect. It's actually an endocardial cushion defect, right? Because, and that's all, that also has implications for what you have to look for as far as the mitral valve and cleft, um, you know, and also looking for a ventricular septal defect that also coexists. Then, of course, the superior sinus and the inferior sinus venosus defects, you also hear Stella von Prague say, traditionally in, in history, that it's actually not a, it's not a hole, it's actually a defect. And so um, she used to say that the uh, right pulmonary vein is usually unroofed, and therefore you get a superior sinus venosus ASD. And that's why it's so common to see partial anomalous pulmonary venous return with these sinus venosus atrial septal defects. And of course, the unroofed coronary sinus is the least common of all of these. Um, but we just had a case of it last week that Dr. McGillivray prepared for us. So let's talk about secundum atrial septal defects. So the indications for treatment are right atrial and right ventricular enlargement. So either of those that suggest that you have left-right shunting that's causing right-side enlargement. A shunt um, ratio of at least 1.5 to 1, and then a PVR to SVR ratio of less than 2 thirds. Um, so the idea of this is that you do not have fixed pulmonary vascular, fixed pulmonary vascular disease. Because if you do, then that means that you probably shouldn't close this because the patient may not do well. Now, that's being challenged because there's actually a study now that's looking at that more specifically. Um, but that's the traditional teaching. And of course, in all of these patients, irrespective of when they actually had their ASD closed, we need to follow these patients because number one, you need to follow the device if it was a device closure. Number two, they continue to be at risk for developmental pulmonary hypertension as well as atrial fibrillation. And so that's why I routinely get in my device closure patients an echo about once a year to make sure there are no issues. And as you guys have probably heard, there's also the possibility of developing erosion due to the amplasser device, which can certainly lead to sudden death. Um, finally, if there is a residual shunt late after surgical repair, which can happen 50 years later, and that is actually happening these days, these patients may be at risk of cryptogenic stroke because they too could develop a right to left shunt or bidirectional shunting through their atrial septal defects. So moving on to the post-tricuspid shunts. So as I mentioned, me typically- yeah. Uh, is sizing of the hole important to you, and is the margins important to you? Margins? Great question. Thanks for bringing that up. No, sizing is not important. And the reason why sizing is not important is because we actually, it's very challenging when you think about it, right? Because we think of the atrial septum as a planar, um, a planar structure, but it actually isn't. It's actually a three-dimensional structure. So if you actually slice it in the plane, try to size it, you're probably still not going to be quite orthogonal to it, right? And so what we actually do in the cat lab is we actually put a sizing balloon, which is a very soft balloon across it, inflate it until on Doppler we see no more flow through the atrial septal defect. And the idea of this is we're forcing the defect into a more circular, more round 
kind of shape because that's the shape of our device. The second thing, of course, is that it helps us to sort of make it into a two-dimensional structure. And so understanding the rims and understanding the size and shape, et cetera, et cetera, is somewhat helpful, but not absolutely. One thing I will say um, that has made a little bit challenging is when you say something like no rims for closure, it kind of puts us in a little bit of a difficult situation. So that is a moving target. How big do the rims have to be for closure is a moving target. It used to be a mandatory part of the IFU that you had to have five millimeters. That's sort of moving at this point in time and that continues to get amended. Part of the problem is that it's not an absolute number. The way you decide whether or not it's safe to close a, a defect with an Amplaster device is the length of the atrial septum versus the size of the defect. Because in a very large device, the left atrial disc is actually going to be 14 millimeters larger than the, than the part that covers the hole. So for example, if you have a 24 millimeter hole and you put a 24 millimeter device, the parts that's, that's gonna sit in the left atrium and potentially cause erosion is gonna be 38 millimeters. So even if we make this mythical five millimeter rim, it probably has no impact whatsoever on a situation where you have a small kid with a large hole. So even if you have five millimeter rim, that may not be enough. So I think it's helpful for a little bit of guidance, but I don't know that I would kill myself to try to measure all those things and to understand all the rims. So unless it's a study, if it's a research study, it becomes a different issue. But great question. Okay, so moving on to post strike custom shunt. So, um, so what I've done here is to show a little diagram where, where you're increasing the blood flow through the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary arterial circulation. And what that actually does is when you have VSD and left right shunting through a VSD that's uh, post tricuspid shunt through a VSD or PDA or aortic pulmonary window, what it does is it forces a lot more blood flow through the pulmonary circulation, which comes back quickly to the left side of circulation because you have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. And because the systemic vascular resistance is about one-tenth that of the pulmonary vascular resistance, the fellows know this because I talk about this all the time at CAT conference, then you have massive shunting that goes from left to right. And what it functions as is almost like much regurgitation where you load the left ventricle further. And so what ends up happening is these kids, these babies actually don't present with pulmonary hypertension per se. What they actually present with is they present with left-sided heart failure symptoms. So they present with pulmonary edema. And the way they actually manifest that is they don't obviously complain with a shorter breath. They actually become diaphoretic and they can't feed. So they can't continuously breastfeed because they develop pulmonary edema and dyspnea exertion. So typically what we'll end up seeing in these patients is we'll see severely enlarged left ventricle and left atrium until of course they develop an increased pulmonary vascular resistance in which case they develop Eisenmenger syndrome. So this is a patient that was, uh, whose case was sent to me early on when I first got here. It's a um, nine month old from Africa. And what you can see here in the short axis is this, right? So something's not right here. I'm sorry, this is not short axis, this is uh, the aorta. So clearly there's something coming off here that's very big, that's about the size of this. What do you guys think this is? Well, obviously I gave it away. <laughs> the world's worst. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is what happens in an infant, okay? And so you can actually see what's happened to the mitral valve at this point in time. So this kid has been going, going along for so long with this PDA that's the size of his aorta that he's now developed functional mitral regurgitation as a result of um, left ventricular dilation. And so ultimately, there was really no way we could help this kid. The kid couldn't get to the United States. Nobody could go and operate on the kid. So uh, the kid ultimately expired. So what that means is today in third world countries, people still actually die of patent vector arteriosis, which is kind of hard to imagine since it's probably one of the easiest procedures in cath lab these days. So <coughs> ventricular septal defects. So I'm not going to actually spend a whole lot of time on the anatomy of ventricular septal defects because it's not really too relevant to us um, by the time they reach adulthood. Because for the most part, a typical presentation for a patient who has a large non-restrictive ventricular septal defect is that they're gonna have Eisenmenger syndrome, which means that they now have bidirectional shunting because their pulmonary vascular resistance matches their systemic vascular resistance, okay? And so they're typically gonna be blue, they're gonna be satting anywhere between the 70s to 80s, possibly in the 90s sometimes if you're lucky. Um, and they quote unquote have pulmonary hypertension because their pulmonary vascular resistance is at least 10 woods units or higher, okay? And so typically you may not actually even see significant Doppler flow through the VSD and you may not actually hear much of a murmur because of that. But one of the things that you typically will still see today, especially in immigrant populations, is the risk for endocarditis from a ventricular septal defect. In fact, we have a patient who has pulmonic valve endocarditis who had a restrictive ventricular septal defect and we think maybe that was the source of his pulmonic valve endocarditis because otherwise that's pretty unusual. Now, what is restrictive ventricular septal defect? 
means if flow is limited through the defect. And in quantitative. Well, Eisenbanger has that too. There's not equalization of pressures between yeah. the two different Okay. Not right. significant. Not significant. <laughs> okay. All right. So generally speaking, uh, you know, I kind of use as a, as a rough measure four meters per second jet. Okay. Is that probably definitive? No, because I mean, if you have a hypertensive patient, four meter per second jet still has really high RV pressure. Right. So I'm not sure that that's the best. In kids, that's a great number. Right. But in adults, I'm not sure that's the best number anymore. But irrespective, I think once you get to four meters per second and above, you're probably getting to the point where it's probably not going to create a whole lot of shunt. And your shunt ratio, like you guys have been talking about, is probably going to be one point five to one less, which probably means that if they're, not, if they're not actually symptomatic, you probably don't need to do anything about it. Um, but what I do watch for very carefully in my patients who have membranous ventricular septal defects, and the membranous ventricular septal defects probably <coughs> the most common, um, is the development of aortic regurgitation. So what does this, this actually look like? So, this is a really great review paper from Annals of Internal Medicine. And so the idea is that you have this left to right shunting that's very minimal, okay, that goes through this membranous ventricular septal defect. But over time, what it does is it actually causes the prolapse of the aortic valve structure through, and ultimately you end up developing aortic regurgitation. And I've seen at least a couple different cases where this has happened, where a kid was quote unquote monitored for her entire childhood. Once they got to adulthood, they were told, oh, you don't need to be followed anymore because the BSD hasn't caused any problems. And they showed up with chronic severe aortic regurgitation and diastolic heart failure. Um, and so this is why I actually continue to monitor these patients every regularly. So probably you could monitor them every two to five years, but the problem is that's pretty hard to do. So in my clinic, I usually see them once a year just to make sure they don't fall off the face of the earth. So one of the other things that you typically have to think about if you have a non-restricted ventricular septal defect and the patient looks just fine is that you have a right ventricular helpful tract obstruction and they have a tetralogy flow type of physiology. So that's what we're going to go next. So in right side obstructions, um, one of the most important things that I need to emphasize here is that right ventricular pressure does not equal pulmonary arterial pressure. Okay? And you see this all the time in my tetralogy flow patients, in my truncus arteriosus patients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that it's reported that they have a PA pressure of X, Y, and Z. So that is not the case. When you're measuring the TR jet, you're measuring the RV pressure. And it's critical that you document that because you're going to help me hunt for it. Okay, so the truth is uh, right-sided obstruction can occur anywhere along the lines. So the tricuspid valve, the subvalvar level, so infundibular pulmonic stenosis, valvar pulmonic stenosis, supervalvar pulmonic stenosis, and then bilateral branch PA stenosis. And it can actually happen all the way out into the third order of pulmonary arteries, and they can affect any one of these patients. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus a little bit on tetralogy flow. So for those of you guys who don't remember the specifics of tetralogy flow, the bottom line is this. You have right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So primarily it's due to infundibular obstruction from RV muscle bundles that obstruct the right ventricular outflow tract. And then you have a small annulus for the pulmonic valve. And then finally, of course, you have the BSD. You have overriding aorta, et cetera, et cetera. But probably for physiological reasons, the, the most important things are to focus on the RVOT obstruction and the BSD. So what the surgeon has to do in childhood, and this is happening earlier and earlier now, we're talking about potentially at one month of age, um, the surgeon will actually resect out those RV muscle bundles that are obstructing, slice through the pulmonic valve annulus, and then patch across it. And the reason why they're doing this is they want to get that pulmonic valve annulus as large as the aortic valve annulus, right? Because theoretically, that's what you should be doing to get that full cardiac output out. So what that does then is the moment you've done that, you've created wide open pulmonic insufficiency. So it's possible that this baby has wide open pulmonic insufficiency from one month of age. So irrespective of how their tetralogy of flow is repaired, most of them are going to have wide open pulmonic insufficiency because we haven't figured out a better way to do it. There have been people who have been quote unquote experimenting with valve sparing surgeries, but the reality is for the most part, most patients are left with a pulmonary valve body. And the truth of the matter is prior to 1980, when, um, when we first started doing pulmonary balloon valvuloplasties, all patients with any type of pulmonic stenosis were treated with this type of surgery. So any patient who's had a pulmonary valve body surgically probably has this problem as well. So what does this end up doing? Well, if you have wide open pulmonic insufficiency for 30 years, sooner or later you're going to get valve replacement, right? So this is a typical situation. So this is a patient that was sent to me by George Shrove. He's 36 years old. He was repaired at age one. He's quote unquote asymptomatic. He can bench press 600 pounds. He does mixed martial arts as his hobby. So he probably is asymptomatic, other than the fact that he has occasional palpitations. So when he saw me on day two of his event monitor, this is what he had. So why does he have VT? 
pretty obvious. If you have 30 something years of um, wide open harmonic insufficiency, this is what your RV looks like, okay? And so this is probably the most impressive uh, example that I've seen in quite some time. And you can see that the LV is really sort of bowed over by the right ventricular volume overload. So obviously the solution for this is this patient now needs a surgical pulmonic valve replacement. So he gets a bioprosthetic pulmonic valve replacement because we think that that's probably the optimal thing to do for these patients. Because it turns out that there are a lot of mechanical valve thromboses when we started trying to do that in the pulmonic position. And the problem is with this ultimately is that ultimately he's gonna need something else done down the line. So that's where transcatheter valve technology becomes very helpful. So the Melody valve um, is a bovine jugular venous valve that's sewn onto a platinum meridian stent and then crimped onto a balloon-tipped catheter, um, just like most of the other transcatheter valve systems. And uh, the difference is that it, here it's delivered through the femoral venous um, access site. It can actually also be delivered from the internal jugular venous access site or even a hybrid percutaneous approach from the, uh, um, from the direct RV puncture. So here you can see it being delivered into an RV to PA conduit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so with the balloon expansion, you see just like all transcatheter valve systems, delivery of the valve, and immediate function in the valve. So the problem with this, of course, is this is yet another bioprosthetic pulmonic valve, right? So you started with bioprosthetic pulmonic valve, you bought yourself maybe 10 to 15 years, and hopefully you will buy yourself another 10 to 15 years, but sooner or later, you're going to need to do something about this too. So this is what it looks like, typically, um, when we deploy a melody valve. It's the darkest step that you see there. And of course, you can see here that it's um, well, it's excellent competence at this point in time. So again, just to summarize, tetralogy flow, pretty much all tetralogy flows are going to need a pulmonic, pulmonic valve replacement at some point in their lives. Prior to this, they are at risk of, uh, of arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, and then likewise, um, if they've had a BT shunt, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, they are potentially at risk of sudden death, and you also have to look at their QRS complex for widening from that standpoint. But they also develop aortic root, um, aortic regurgitation issues. And of course, they continue to need evaluation and recurrent intervention. So one of the things that I wanted to sort of talk about today is um, what we do with some of the images that you, you guys create. So when we have a patient who undergoes a CT um, in the cardiac CT lab, what we can actually do is we can bring that CT data set into the cath lab. And so what I've done is I've represented the patient on the table in blue and then the data set from the CT scan in orange. And so what we need to do is we need to register the two together. So we'll reorient the data set and then we'll actually superimpose it. And then once we've done that, we can take that entire data set and use it in the cath lab. And so once that's done um, with the system that we have in the cath lab, it's pretty much registered. So movement um, forward and backwards, left and right, is all registered as well as is the gantry angles of the, of the detector. So one of the things we can do now, which is really fantastic, is we can take a CT data set and then we can actually do 2D to 3D registration, which basically means that we can take the image, in, uh, the image detector in the cath lab and shoot two views. So we'll take an LAO view and an RAO view, and then using the bony structures, actually Ron Rush is right there, he's the one who usually does this for us, um, you can actually superimpose what's in pink, which is the CT data, onto the bony landmarks in the fluoroscopy data, and then using those two views, you can actually synchronize the CT data on top of it. And what that allows you to do is do this. So now we can take this CT data set and we can actually superimpose regions of interest from the CT data set or even a 3D reconstruction on top of our fluoroscopic uh, data. And so what you can see here is then this is, um, this is a pre-evaluation for melody valve prior to the implantation of the melody valve. And this is what it looks like once we implanted the melody valve. So this is the true infundibulum. This is where they previously placed um, the RVDPA homograph and where the stenosis was. So, that's why oftentimes you'll see a patient in the CT scanner for a preoperative CT scan because what we can do is save a lot of radiation and a lot of contrast by taking the CT scan that they've already gotten and using that full 3D data set in the cath lab or the hybrid operating room. So, um, as I've mentioned, a lot of them will develop severe RV enlargement secondary to the severe PI. One of the other problems that we have to deal with is sometimes they do develop true pulmonary hypertension and that's why we have to hunt so specifically for where is that gradient? So first you find that they have elevated RV pressure. Then we have to actually look at Doppler, the pulmonic valve, and then we potentially, if possible, we like to Doppler into the pulmonary arteries too to see whether or not the branch PAs are the source of their gradient that's causing their elevated RV pressures. Because if that's not the case, then we have the worst case scenario, which is that they've developed primary pulmonary hypertension, which can happen after they've actually been shunted. I did mention a little bit briefly about shunted physiology and how that can actually lead to sudden death. But more importantly, on the left side, 
The rare complications are that they can develop aortic root enlargement as well as aortic insufficiency as well as LV dysfunction. It's rare, but it's something that we have to look for. And so those are all the things that you have to look for in tetralogic fallot. So when I see a tetralogic fallot patient, the first question is, have they had a pulmonic valve replacement? So pulmonic valve replacement can occur in the form of a valved conduit. So this is a Hancock valve conduit. This is a bioprosthetic valve. And then, of course, the third thing is the very typical thing, which is a RVDPA homograft. So this is a cadaveric um, uh, pulmonary artery. So if they have had a pulmonic valve replacement, then the question becomes, well, do they have pulmonic valve stenosis or regurgitation? Because depending on when this was put in, they may develop stenosis or regurgitation or combination thereof. On the other hand, if they have not had a pulmonic valve regurgitation, it's all, I mean, sorry, pulmonic valve replacement, it's almost guaranteed that they're going to have pulmonic regurgitation. So then the next question becomes, what is their RV size? Because we actually use the RV volume to decide when we're going to replace the pulmonic valve. So typically we use RV volumes from MRI to actually determine that. But sometimes if we can't get an MRI because they have a lot of um, metallic artifact from MRI, then we'll actually use CT scanning to get our RV volumes. So in addition, um, we'll also be looking for PA stenoses, residual VSDs, pulmonary hypertension, as I mentioned, um, aortic root aneurysm, and aortic insufficiency and LV dysfunction. So, Great question. Why is it LV? Great question. So um, I was, in the interest of time, I didn't actually bring the papers, but uh, the traditional thought is that 170 RV EDVI, so right ventricular end diastolic volume index of 170 milliliters per meter squared, so indexed against body surface area, is the point of no return. If you wait past that, most patients will not remodel, so their RV will not shrink back to normal size. So that's definitely, you don't want to wait that long or you don't want to wait any further than that. So a lot of people are now pushing for earlier. It initially got pushed to 165, then 160, but now people are thinking, well, 150 is pretty large anyway. So perhaps we should er operate earlier at about 150, and then we can prevent all the other problems that can happen, such as you know, heart failure symptoms and uh, ventricular tachycardia, et cetera, et cetera. So we're now starting to move towards 150 and just slightly below that. So if somebody looks like they're getting to be close to 150, we probably want to go ahead and operate. That is in the setting something else that suggests that they have right ventricular volume overload a VO2 max that's not optimal, which is most of these patients, um, symptoms of some kind that seem uh, suspicious, arrhythmias, atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, et cetera. So size, so it has to be both size and symptoms? Not size and symptoms, size and something else that's size. suspicious, yeah. And that's based on a Talgiva um, review article. So again, it's not necessarily based on data. The other major problem is that it's probably not volume. Right, at the end of the day, volume should not be our threshold, but it's the only thing that we have, unfortunately, because we haven't come up with a VO2 max uh, target yet. Um, so, tough, I mean, it's a tough question, but I think probably earlier is better. Steve? Well, it does sort of. So the problem with RV systolic function is it can be down for various different reasons, okay? And so one of the major problems that we found is that it can be down even before the volume has actually become a problem. And then the other major problem becomes if it's a pure regurgitant lesion, the RV systolic function doesn't come back after we replace the valve, typically. So it's a hard one. I think if you see a change in RV systolic function over time in a patient who has a pure regurgitant lesion, it probably is an indication to fix it. But it's a little bit less optimistic about whether or not that RV systolic function will return. So if it's a mixed lesion where there's, uh, where there's actual um, stenosis, that, you know, you can actually usually see systolic function improve afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it, you'd have to think pretty hard about it because they probably also have symptoms too with an RV systolic function in the 30s. Um, and they're probably intermittently on diuretics or constantly on diuretics at that point. So I have a couple of patients who are floating around like that. So. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me skip through this real quick in the interest of time. Okay. So what I wanted to point out with this is um, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about truncus arteriosus, but I wanted to emphasize that there are a lot of patients who are actually treated with RVDPA homographs, and that is typically in a situation where they don't have an independent trunk for the pulmonary artery, and truncus arteriosus is a typical example. The other places where you can have an RVDP homograph is Ross procedure. So if a patient has severe AS in childhood, one of the things that they'll do for these patients as opposed to putting a prosthetic valve in is to do a Ross procedure. And that leaves them with an RVDP homograph. So don't forget the, R, the right side. 
So when you see that RV hypertension, think about what was their initial operation and do they have some sort of prosthesis in that side? Because most RV to homographs, once they reach, RV to PA homographs, once they reach adulthood, are going to be stenotic, if not regurgitant as well. So left-sided obstruction. So in the congenital space, left-sided obstruction actually comes together. They actually often come together in multiple lesions. So it can involve the mitral valve. It can involve the subvalvar aortic area. It can involve valvar AS, supervalvar AS, in coarctation, as well as middle aortic syndrome, which is a narrowing of the abdominal aorta as well, similar to coarctation in the aorta. And so as an illustration, I'm actually going to show you one particular case of coarctation in the aorta. So coarctation in the aorta, whenever you see a patient who has um, secondary hypertension, you should start thinking about coarctation, especially if they're young. And one of the things that we've actually done uh, pretty frequently now to assess these patients is just do an ABI. It's a lot easier than doing it in the clinic because we have a system to do so. Sometimes, depending on where the coarctation is located, whether it's somewhere um, before, the first, before the left subclavian, you can potentially even have differential blood pressures. Um, it can also be in the situation where you have LV dysfunction because, as you can imagine, this is increased load. So think about this if you're seeing um, secondary hypertension with LV dysfunction. The other thing to think about is that if they've had childhood surgery to repair coarctation, um, you may want to look for a decreased pulse in the left wrist because there's a good chance that they sacralize the left subclavian. Um, I did see one case where somebody tried to recanalize the subclavian artery in a patient who had that. That's not pretty. Um, and then Schoen's complex is the situation where you have multiple left-sided lesions, typically a parachute mitral valve, aortic stenosis, and coarctation of the aorta. You have multiple left-sided lesions in the same patient. So I'm going to show you this case of aortic interruption as sort of an illustration of that particular situation. So this is a 42-year-old man with severe hypertension who had a blood pressure of about 250. It actually uh, presented with, uh, with an MCA stroke in the past, and he was sent to me for evaluation for coarctation. He couldn't get a CT to play. Turns out, actually, we, we found out he actually also has bicuspid aortic valve with my aortic insufficiency, sort of going along with what we're talking about. So this is his initial angiogram. So it's a complete and total interruption of his th descending thoracic aorta. So what we wanted to do is take some of these 3D data sets that we can actually generate um, to fix it. So what we did was in the hybrid operating room, we did a rotational angiogram that actually gave us this three-dimensional reconstruction. And what it did was allow us to actually create these 3D regions of interest to allow us to create a center line perforation because our goal was to actually perforate from the, descent, the descending limb to the proximal limb. And so what we're going to use was rotational angiography to create that 3D reconstructed image and then use this RF perforation wire to perforate directly through the center line across. And that's what this is. So what you can see here is we've drawn these regions of interest to allow center line perforation through the middle of the aorta. And we're checking our position as we burn. So we're burning at two watts, I'm sorry, five watts for two seconds. And this is basically from point to point. And we're checking our position as we go. So finally, once we've crossed, what we can do is we can snare out that wire and externalize it out the left radial access site. So once we've done that, we're pretty much home free because we can get a sheath across and we can take this covered stent and deploy it using a balloon <coughs> across the interrupted aorta. So the guy did fantastic. He was discharged the very next day on just, with just two medications, but we're not done, okay, because as I told you, this guy has bicuspid aortic valve. He is prone to develop aneurysms because there may be some, some degree of aerotopathy in, in these patients. We did scan his head to look for aneurysms, because, uh, cerebral aneurysms, because about 10% of these patients actually have them. So for all of our coarctations, irrespective of whether they were repaired with surgery or a catheter technique, we need to look for a recurrent coarctation, okay? And one of the things that you want to look for with echo is when you do your notch view, you want to look for continued flow during diastole because that suggests that the coarctation is pretty significant, okay? About 10% of these patients may actually have a cerebral aneurysm, so they need to be scanned at least once in their lifetime to look for their cerebral aneurysms. They need serial thoracic CT or MR imaging to look for aneurysms uh, of their aorta, specifically in certain types of repairs, which I won't get into detail. Um, and then, of course, a lot of them have bicuspid aortic valve, and so these patients also need to be monitored for the development of aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Um, and then, of course, as with all left-sided lesions, a lot, of these a lot of times these kids who are operated in childhood actually don't know what they had done. So you will want to look for evidence of parachute mitral valve, subaortic membrane, aortic valve, aortic involvement, and even after transplant, you need to continue looking for these left-sided lesions because they had um, arch stenosis or arch hypoplasia or coarctation in the aorta, those don't go away after transplant and they need to be assessed down the line. 
Okay. All right. So, home stretch. Last two topics. Discordance. So the typical discordance is the um, ventricular arterial discordance. So this is one of the most common um, uh, complex uh, congenital heart diseases is transmission of the great arteries. So those of you guys who went to boot camp remember this nice little diagram, which basically shows the RV giving rise to the aorta, which gives you blue blood flow going into systemic circulation, which comes back bluer through the venous circulation back to the right atrium. This is what these transposition babies look like when they're born, okay? Then the LV gives rise to the pulmonary artery, which gives rise to the pulmonary circulation, and comes back redder to the pulmonary veins. And so basically, in this situation, the minute the baby's um, disconnected from the placental circulation and starts to die, and their pH gets down to something like 6.8. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to cross the circulation. So you need to make some mixing happen. And so the way that's done nowadays is something called the Rashkin septostomy, which can be done at bedside using echo guidance. And so typically what can be done is we can cannulate the umbilical vein or we can cannulate the femoral vein and introduce a balloon tip catheter across the PFO inflate the balloon tip catheter in the left atrium or rip a hole across the atrial septum and immediately start to see sats rise to the 80s and the pH starts to become into the 7s. Um, and that's because you're now actually creating atrial level mixing, okay? As long as the baby has a patent ductus arteriosus, that can potentially aid as well in, in the mixing. But that's not a definitive solution, okay? So the earliest definitive solution was something called the atrial switch. Um, so it's called either the sunning switch or the, or the mustard procedure. So the mustard procedure is, is using um, uh, pericardium or other, um, or, or graft or dacron type material, whereas sunning is actually using the true atrial tissue to actually create these baffles. And so what they actually did was to um, take the SVC and the IVC venous blood flow and baffle it over to the left atrium, which then gives rise to the left ventricle, which serves as the subpulmonary ventricle and gives rise to the pulmonary artery. And then the blue blood goes to the lungs and comes back red. And then the pulmonary veins are then baffled to the right atrium, right ventricle, and then the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta. So things are a little bit backwards, but at least now you've actually got circulation that is physiologic. The problem, though, of course, is you can imagine that you're going to have a problem eventually because the RV is pumping against the systemic um, uh, circulation. And so sooner or later, the RV will actually fail. And that's a typical problem that we see. So what does that actually look like? So this is one of the first patients I ever took care of. He's a 28-year-old man with detransposition of the great arteries, atrial switch. Okay, so he was actually running home from third base um, for their office, I think it was their office softball party, a uh, softball game when, uh, when he collapsed. He got bystander CPR because there were two physicians in the audience. Um, he was found to be in ventricular fibrillation, defibrillated successfully. So after about a week's stay where he was cooled and then brought back, cath, got an ICD, he walked out of the hospital. So pretty remarkable. Um, but on the other hand, the question is, what, what is going on with these patients and why is this actually happening? So at the end of the day, one of the major problems that we're going to deal with is heart failure because the right ventricle will eventually fail. In addition, atrial arrhythmias are pretty bad for these patients because they can actually degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So we need to take atrial arrhythmias very seriously in these types of patients um, because likewise, it can actually degenerate into sudden death. So they have a couple different reasons for having sudden death. The first one being that their RV systolic function is potentially at jeopardy. Second thing is that they can develop atrial arrhythmias due to all the scar lines that they had, which can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So other complications. So about 11% of them actually will end up developing a permanent pacemaker because of all the surgeries that are done around the sinus node. About 14% of them have atrial flutter. About five in 1,000 develop sudden death. Here is where you guys can really help. So when you have a patient who's had a mustard baffle, we need to start looking for the development of a baffle leak or baffle stenosis. So what can end up happening is that what worked for the baby doesn't work for them in adulthood. And so one of the things you can do is you can actually look through the four chamber view and actually identify the baffles themselves. So if you actually see something coming back from the pulmonary veins, that's clearly the pulmonary venous baffle. And what you want to do is you want to make sure it crosses over and returns to the right atrium the way it should and look for any flow acceleration. Likewise, the SCC and the IVC baffle you can also look for too. So transthoracic is a fantastic tool for looking at the baffles and an important thing to do for all these transposition patients who have atrial switch. So it turns out in the 1980s, we finally figured out how to actually do a definitive repair for these patients, which is an arterial switch. So it turns out you need to do this during the neonatal period because if you don't do it immediately during the neonatal period, the LV becomes accustomed to pumping against the pulmonary circulation and can no longer um, be entrained for the systemic circulation. So usually within the first week of life, you do an arterial switch. So one of the things that they have to do, of course, is they have to take the, um, the coronary arteries off of the original uh, uh, aorta and sew it onto the neo-aorta when they do the switch. 
So the problem is when you do that in a neonate, you can potentially develop coronary kinking in arterial, uh, in arterial uh, lesions, which can potentially develop, give you cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, and even sudden death. Um, the other thing that can happen is because you're taking the pulmonary artery, which used to be posterior, and bringing it forward, you're ending up stretching the branches of the PAs, and that can actually develop pulmonary arterial stenosis. And then finally, this is something that we're beginning to see more and more often. Remember, this used to be the pulmonic root. Okay, so the uh, histology of the pulmonic root is not the same as the aortic root. And so what you can end up developing is neoaortic aneurysm and aortic regurgitation as that neoaorta starts to enlarge. And the problem is that these are the patients that are coming around the corner. So these are now 25 to 30 year old patients. Um, and these are the ones that we're going to be following now. And so when you see a patient with a median astronomy that shows up with a cardiomyopathy and ST elevations and Q waves in the ER, this is potentially what you're dealing with at this point in time. Okay, so final topic, single ventricle. So you can never hear this one enough. So what I'm gonna talk about is just the basics of single ventricle palliation because it's pretty complicated and it would probably be a couple days talk in and of itself. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about it from the framework of hypoplastic left heart because that's, um, that's kind of the typical one that we're dealing with these days and get very sick by the time they get to their 20s. So hypoplastic left heart typically develops in a situation where you have mitral atresia or aortic atresia. And so the left ventricle never fully develops, okay? And so what you can see here is that you have a small aorta um, and that all your blood flow is really coming from the PDA through the common ventricle, which is really the right ventricle. You have to have an open atrial septal defect, okay? And so the first thing that you wanna do because your aorta is small and atretic, and you really need to preferentially get blood flow to your coronary arteries as well as your head and neck vessels, is that you take the branch PAs off of the main PA and you use the main PA to augment the size of the aorta. So that's what you're seeing here in the Norwood. So what you can see here is they've taken the main PA and made a side-to-side -side anastomosis with the aorta to augment the size of the aorta to really get preferential blood flow from the systemic um, right ventricle to the coronary arteries and then the head and neck vessels. Then, because there's nothing giving rise to the branch PAs, the right PA and the left PA anymore, you actually create a shunt, which is called the modified blood lactosic shunt, which is a four millimeter Gore-Tex graft that extends from the innominate artery down to the pulmonary arteries. And that is how now you actually get both your IVC and your SVC blood flow, as well as your pulmonary venous blood flow, mixing your atrium, going to your systemic ventricle, going to your systemic artery, and then circulating to your pulmonary arteries, okay? So the problem with this is this single ventricle is not gonna last very long if you make it do double duty this way, okay? Especially because this is a right ventricle facing systemic pressures. So you need to do something at about three or four months or even earlier if possible, and that is called the Glenn shunt. So what you do with the Glenn shunt now is you take down that modified BT shunt so you no longer make that single ventricle pump through the BT, through the pulmonary circulation anymore. So you take your uh, BT shunt down and then you hook up your SVC to your RPA. And because the RPA is continuous with what used to be the main PA into the LPA, now you have this circulation where you have superior vena cava circulating through RPA and LPA. And that is your source of pulmonary blood flow. In order to not completely put everything through the pulmonary blood flow, um, you have your IVC that still gives rise to your common atrium, um, which fills your uh, systemic ventricle and gives rise to your systemic um, uh, arterial circulation. Okay. So these kids typically have a SAT in the hot mid 80s to high 80s and low 90s. So in order to get them to a normal uh, saturation, the final step is called the Fontan procedure, which is done um, after a couple years of age. So that is where you actually take the S IVC circulation, now you hook it up to the pulmonary artery, so now you have total cable pulmonary connections. So you have SVC and IVC going to the PAs, and so you no longer have blue blood going to the systemic circulation. And what's nice about this then is that your systemic ventricle only has to do one circulation, okay, instead of one and a half circulation as you used to have in the Glenn shunt, okay? So there are different types of Fontan circulations. And so, whoops, so this is the classic version. So the unilateral Glenn is where you would take the SVC and hook it up to the PA primarily, and then you'd actually take the right atrial appendage and hook it up to the LPA. This is the classic Fontan. So this is the oldest form, one of the oldest forms of Fontan. The other way to do it was just to go straight to Fontan, where you take the right atrial pension, just hook it up directly to the main PA. So the problem with this version of the unilateral Glenn and classic Fontan is the SVC doesn't have any of that hepatic factor that we talked about in those liver failure patients, right? And so what ends up happening is your right lung starts to develop pulmonary AVMs. And we see this very typically in some of these patients. 
whereas your left lung is perfectly fine. So these kids start to turn blue, and you can't figure out why they're turning blue, because they shouldn't have any type of shunting anymore. But they do, because you start developing these, these pulmonary AVMs. So they develop basically hepatopulmonary syndrome in the right lung selectively. The other major problem that can happen is because you have this right atrium um, going to your pulmonary circulation, eventually the right atrium just enlarges and enlarges and enlarges. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So nowadays, typically what we're doing is something called lateral tunnel fontan, which basically you create a wall in the middle of the right atrium um, using either Gore-Tex or some other material to create that fontan, or an extracardiac fontan where you just take a tube graft of Gore-Tex or whatever else from the IVC going up to the SBCPA complex, okay? And so these are preferred because they don't dilate the way the classic fontan does. And so this is what it looks like. Let's see, I'll come over here so I can show this. That sucks. So let's see if I can actually scroll this. Yeah, it's going to be hard to see. But basically what you can see here is that the right atrium now basically takes up about half the chest because of the fact that it's, um, it's circulating against the whole Fontan circulation. And what that looks like when you actually look at it sagittally is like this, okay? And so you can imagine how this is very bad for cardiac output, and it's also very bad for the development of atrial arrhythmias. You can see what the right atrium looks like in, um, in an axial slice. So what ends up having to be done to these patients then is something called a Fontan conversion, where we would actually take this whole thing out of the system and actually just create a, uh, the total cable pulmonary connection with some sort of graft going from the IVC up to the glen at that point, okay? And that way, and the indications for that are typically just um, poor cardiac output as well as potentially uh, incessant atrial arrhythmias. Because you can imagine trying to ablate something in this circulation is gonna be pretty challenging. So one thing that you'll actually see here that's a little bit of a concern is that this patient actually has aortic regurgitation, which so far looks like it's tolerated. But one of the things that's really not tolerated is systemic AV valve regurgitation, so atrioventricular valve regurgitation, because you can imagine that this ventricle has to tolerate the support of the entire circulation. So anytime they start to develop AV valve regurgitation, they start to get sick. The other thing is also, what do you think actually drives the flow in the Fontan? Because there's no ventricle, right? Right, well, that helps with it, but what makes that flow happen? Right, so, so basically propelling through the venous circulation, that systolic pressure, right? But also the diastolic flow, right? So, so you really rely on diastole for these patients. So if you start to develop AV valve regurgitation, you can imagine what's going to start to happen to the Fontan pressures, right? It's going to get reflected through the pulmonary capillary system to the other side. So, um, so anyway, we talked about this. So what I want to show you is this. So not everything's good with a lateral tunnel Fontan either. So this is a lateral tunnel Fontan of one of my patients. Some of you guys actually may know her. And what you're seeing here is there's a Starflex device that's been placed in that fenestration. So typically a fenestration is created to allow decompression of the Fontan into the common atrium. But what you're seeing, if you look carefully, is that that Starflex is really not doing anything because there's still flow right there. Okay, so she's blue. And the reason why she's blue is she continues to have a, f a fenestration right to left shunting through that Fontan. So eventually we want to try to do something for that. So this is, this is it. So major problems that you can actually deal with with Fontan is protein-losing enteropathy. So protein-losing enteropathy starts to come out when you have elevated Fontan pressures because you start to lose um, protein proteinaceous fluid into the gut because of elevated venous pressures. The same thing can happen with your bronchi. So you can actually start to ooze proteinaceous fluid into your bronchi that forms solid casts in the bronchi that need to be removed with, um, with uh, rigid bronchoscopy. The other major problem you can imagine, as most of our patients who are right side of heart failures, they actually are at risk for cardiac cirrhosis. And then worse yet, it turns out that these patients are at risk of actually developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and then it actually turns out you can actually develop hemoptysis from systemic uh, pulmonary collaterals. As I mentioned, systemic AV valve dysfunction is a serious problem for these patients and it needs to be taken very seriously. If they start to develop this, you need to start thinking about what needs to be done for that systemic AV valve because it probably needs to be addressed. And then finally, systemic ventricular dysfunction is kind of a, um, the death knell for the Fontan circulation because eventually once you get to that point, you need to start thinking about whether or not they're a transplant candidate because once they develop protein-losing enteropathy or hepatocellular, uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or cirrhosis, they're really going to be in trouble and not a candidate anymore. So let's move on here. So here's the summary, okay? So where your shunt is relative to the tricuspid valve really depends, I'm sorry, 
really gives you your different types of physiology. So pre-tricuspid gives you right-sided heart failure, post-tricuspid gives you left-sided heart failure at presentation. Tetralogy flow, probably the most important point I'm going to leave, with, leave you with today, which is that they all need a pulmonary valve replacement, and they're all at risk of bad things happening like ventricular arrhythmias until they get that pulmonic valve replaced. Coartation, like all of our left-sided lesions, you need to look for other left-sided lesions that coincide with these patients. Bicuspid atrial valve and coarctation is a typical example. Um, uh, the arterial switch is now what's the most common uh, palliation for transposition of the great arteries, and you need to look at the coronaries and you need to look at the pulmonary arteries. And then finally, over time, you need to start looking at their, aort their neo-aortic valve and aortic root for development of aortic aneurysm and, and aortic regurgitation. And then finally, Fontan is complicated. I think that's probably the best that I can say at this point in time. And that's probably one of those where you want to work uh, in a lot of detail with uh, a congenital heart specialist. But most of all, these patients were born with a heart defect. They have no idea what normal is. So always be suspicious of asymptomatic. Save the day for this. I'm actually going to start to ask you guys to present at this um, this year. So I'll probably ask each of you guys to give a little case presentation for each of the sessions. So make sure you save this date because I think this is going to be a really great course this year. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? All right, Nishant. How do you put the patient at the It's a good question. So you ha either have to do epicardial um, or you have to try to do something on the systemic the side. Eh, that's not a really great idea because the problem is it's a nidus with thrombus, right? And so once these patients start to de develop protein losing enteropathy, just like nephrotic syndrome, they actually become procoagulable. So then, then you're at some serious trouble because then they can get cardiogenic stroke. So usually I think epicardial is the way to go if you can. Good question there. Other questions? Yeah. Good question. So they can develop two types of collaterals. The first one is arterial pulmonary collaterals, which is basically they go to the pulmonary circulation, the pulmonary arterial circulation. And they can come off of, say, the internal mammaries. They can come off the subclavians, et cetera, et cetera. The other ones that they can develop are venovenous collaterals, which are basically from the systemic veins to the pulmonary veins. And so those are the ones that make them blue. So they can both bleed. Probably the arterial pulmonary collaterals are the ones that really create problems. Now, different surgeons have different ideas. Okay, so some surgeons, especially in the pediatric world, really don't care. Some surgeons are anal retentive and they say, I need you to address all of them before I take the patient to the OR. And typically where we need to address them is going from Glen to Fontan. Because that's, when they're in Glen, they're still blue. And when they're blue, that's when you have the drive to develop collaterals. Other questions? Yeah, at this point, it's still a stage procedure, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, because, you know, there's certain things that have to happen physiologically for the kid, but there's a lot of talk about trying to do the Glen as a setup for a transcatheter Fontan completion. Um, it's actually interesting because, you know, one of the um, surgical greats in the 1980s was actually doing that, and then he got busted because he wasn't doing any kind of IRB protocol for it, and kids were having bad outcomes from it, and so... Otherwise, we probably would be further with it at this point. Because, I mean, we have everything we need, right? Endovascular stent grafts would be perfect. And perforation is something we do on a regular basis, so. Okay, thanks, guys.